All right. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Crystal Ann Roussel, and I'm joining you today from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many First Nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Um, as Andrew said, I'm a staff lawyer at the Canadian Environmental Law Association, or CELA, and I'm also the water policy coordinator for CELA's Healthy Great Lakes program. Um, and today I'll be presenting on healthy water and sustainable planning in Ontario. Um, in terms of a brief agenda, I'll start by telling you a little bit about CELA, then I'll provide a very quick overview of the land use planning framework in Ontario and outline some of the challenges in terms of using land use planning to protect water. Uh, finally, I'll go over some, some ways you can get involved. Uh, so just a little bit about CELA. Um, CELA is a public interest law organization dedicated to environmental equity, justice, and health. CELA was founded in 1970 with financial support from Legal Aid Ontario as a specialty clinic to provide free legal services to low-income people and disadvantaged communities. And in terms of what we do, CELA represents clients, conducts law reform work and policy analysis, and provides free public legal education on a range of issues aimed at protecting human health, air, land, water, and nature. Um, CELA places high priority on cases and law reform work aimed at ensuring access to environmental justice and ensuring safe, healthy, and livable communities. Um, so I know I'm short on time, but I'll start today with just a very quick overview of the land use planning framework in Ontario. Um, and obviously I'm really just going to touch the surface. Um, there are so many uh, laws and regulations at play uh, that I just can't get to them all in 15 minutes. But I'll try to hit the key ones. Uh, so in terms of jurisdiction, uh, the responsibility for land use planning in Ontario is shared between uh, the province and municipalities. Uh, and as you can see in this picture, the province sets kind of the ground rules and directions for land use planning through the Planning Act, the Provincial Policy Statement or PPS. Um, and in certain part of, parts of the province, provincial plans and source protection plans also provide more detailed and geographically specific policies. Um, and then on the other side, municipalities and planning boards implement the province's land use planning framework by preparing official plans and zoning bylaws and by making land use planning decisions such as approving subdivisions or, or granting consents. Um, so I mentioned that the Planning Act, the PPS, provincial plans, all kind of set the ground rules for land use planning. Um, so I'll just spend a little bit of time going over each of these now. Um, the Planning Act is the basis of Ontario's land use planning system. It defines the approach to planning and assigns or provides the rules of all key participants. The Planning Act is the legal foundation for key planning processes such as local planning administration, development control, land division, and so on. Um, and it also sets out processes and tools for planning and controlling development, including, uh, as I mentioned, official plans, plans of subdivisions, things like that. Um, all decisions under the Planning Act must follow provincial policy direct direction as set out in the PPS and provincial plans. Um, and the Planning Act also provides members of the public with certain rights to participate in the planning process, um, which I'll get into a bit later on in the presentation. Um, and the Provincial Policy Statement, or PPS, is issued under Section 3 of the Planning Act and provides policy direction on matters related to land use planning that are of provincial interest. Um, so as it relates to water, the PPS includes direction on a number of uh, matters, such as stormwater management and the wise use and management of natural heritage features and water resources. 
Um, the Planning Act provides that all municipal planning policies and decisions must be consistent with the PPS, which means that municipalities are given a certain degree of discretion in terms of deciding how to best achieve policies in the PPS. Um, and I'll get into this a bit later in the presentation, particularly some of the problems with this discretionary approach. Um, so the PBS also provides the policy foundation for a number of provincial plans. Uh, and as with the PBS, uh, municipal uh, official plans and zoning bylaws are really the primary vehicle for implementing provincial plans and decisions under the Planning Act must conform with or not conflict with the applicable provincial plan if there is one. Um, unlike the PPS, which applies province-wide, provincial plans apply to particular areas in the province and provide policy direction to address specific needs or objectives in the places where they apply. Um, and I put a couple examples on the screen here of some provincial plans. So another key component of the land use planning framework is drinking water source protection, which is addressed primarily through the Clean Water Act and associated source water protection plans. Um, the Ontario government passed the Clean Water Act in 2006 to implement some of the recommendations of the Walkerton inquiry. And the act requires that areas identified as source protection areas develop a source protection plan which is essentially a strategy and a suite of policies designed to protect municipal sources of drinking water from contamination and overuse. And these plans must have policies that address significant drinking water threats and may also contain policies that address low and moderate drinking water threats. Um, the act requires that all decisions under the Planning Act must conform with significant threat policies and designated Great Lakes policies set out in source protection plans, and they must have regard to other policies set out in the source protection plan. Um, so this image here, which is a bit outdated, but uh, still applies, um, shows where and how kind of all of these laws and policies I just described apply in Ontario. Um, so what are some of the challenges we see on the ground in terms of actually implementing these laws and policies to ensure that water is protected? Um, as you can imagine, there are a lot of problems when it comes to protecting our water through land use planning mechanisms. But for the purposes of today's presentation, I'm going to focus on three big ones. Um, first, as I mentioned, land use planning decisions are highly discretionary which often means they are ill-suited to ensuring water is protected. Uh, second, the role of conservation authorities in land use planning has been constrained in recent months. And third, there has been a drastic increase in the use of ministerial zoning orders. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, the Planning Act requires that land use planning decisions are consistent with the PPS and conform with or do not conflict with applicable provincial plans. Uh, the practical reality is that these determinations are highly discretionary. The PPS, for example, provides that all applicable policies should be considered simultaneously by decision makers. In SEAL's experience, the aim, scope, and complexity of these policies often makes it really difficult to do so, particularly if a planning matter involves competing or conflicting policies, which they often do. Um, and further, the evidence put before decision makers about potential environmental impacts of a proposal is often one-sided as it comes from the proponent. Um, so as a result, the decision makers often do not use their planning powers effectively or at all to secure the protection of our water. Um, CELA often represents clients engaged in land use planning disputes where municipal authorities have failed or refused to exercise their planning act powers in a timely and reasonable manner to safeguard 
local aquifers, for example, used by residents for drinking water purposes. Um, for instance, CELA recently represented the Trout Lake Campers Association after the Lakehead Rural Planning Board approved an application to operate an aggregate pit beside a residential and res recreational area at Trout Lake. Um, in this case, we raised serious concerns about the sufficiency of the environmental evidence put before the decision maker at that time about adverse impacts on nearby wetlands and the lake and about the potential for well water contamination. And one of SEAL's main arguments was that the board focused solely on provisions of the PPS that support aggregate development and failed to balance or consider other relevant provisions, such as those that require development not to impair water features or um, require sensitive surface and groundwater features to be protected, improved, and restored. Um, oh, sorry, skipped forward there. <laughs> One more recent challenge uh, in terms of implementing the land use planning framework to protect our water is that the role of conservation authorities has been significantly constrained. Uh, so on December 8th, 2020, the government on, of Ontario passed an omnibus but budget measures bill 229 into law. And this bill introduced really fundamental changes to the Conservation Authorities Act and the role of conservation authorities in land use planning. Um, so the CAA, was originally established to you know, respond to poor land, water, and forestry management practices. And the mandate of CAs prior to Bill 229 was to undertake watershed-based programs to protect people and property from flooding and other natural hazards. Um, as arm's length agencies whose jurisdiction is on a watershed basis, CAs really had decades of experience and tech technical expertise related to protecting water. They've played crucial roles in ensuring drinking water source protections and regulating development in or adjacent to rivers, lakes, and, and wetlands. Um, but Bill 229's amendments really undermined the ability of CAs to use their expertise to protect our water sources. For example, it requires at least 70% of uh, conservation authority members to be municipal councillors and threshold qualifications for members, which means that municipalities may not be able to appoint members of the public with relevant expertise. Um, it also narrows the duties of uh, CA members such that it no longer includes acting to further the objects of the act and provides that the duty of members who are counselors will be to act on behalf of their municipality. Um, so this is problematic because municipal boundaries and interests often do not align with um, you know, watershed boundaries or ensure that water is a paramount concern in land use planning. Um, maybe I'll skip over <laughs> these points since I see that I only have one minute left. Um, so finally, the last challenge we're seeing is that the increased use of ministerial zoning orders has really presented significant challenges in terms of protecting our water. Um, MZOs are part of Ontario's Planning Act and essentially allow the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to make a ruling on how a piece of land is to be used with no chance of appeal. Um, MZOs were originally intended to be used only in emergency circumstances or to kind of quickly advance a major initiative of provincial significance. However, the current government has been using MZOs much more frequently to circumvent the land use planning process and then push development forward. Um, so obviously the problem with this is that MZOs override the local planning process and do not really allow for consideration of all necessary issues, including source water protection and the protection of our natural resources. Um, so maybe I'll skip over these slides too about how you, how you can get involved. 
Um, and so that'll bring me to the end of my presentation. So thank you so much for having me today. Um, and if you have any specific questions about my presentation, please don't hesitate to reach out at the email address on this slide here. And you can also check out CELA's website and the website for the CELA Foundation at the links on this slide.